Warning, this episode contains details that some listeners may find disturbing. 1959, Beverly Hills, California. 45-year-old George Reeves, the actor who brought Superman to life on screen, met a baffling and untimely death. Was it suicide, like the authorities concluded, or something far more sinister? George Reeves' death isn't simple because it's full of secrets, scandals, and shadowy figures of 1950s Hollywood, where one of the country's most famous celebrities had their life cut short. This is a study of Strange. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael May, and returning this evening is Sean Anthony Davis, who was previously on my Internet Mysteries episode. How you doing, Sean? I'm good. Coming off that, you know, big win. We solved all the internet. We solved all the mysteries. Oh, that's online. right. Yeah. I actually we, forgot we solved all the mysteries. That's, that's right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah. you took, took a little break <laughs> from all that sleuthing, the figuring things out. You're welcome. I don't think any yes. new internet uh, mysteries have cropped up, but if, if they have, well, well they actually have. I've been tracking it because Ooh. I don't even know if you know this, but for a while, that was my highest downloaded. Oh, I think you did mention was. that. Yeah. That was like, I was very like, oh, when, when you gave me that little tidbit, I was pretty like pumped to hear that. It's a fun episode. I thought it was like, I it was one of my easier episodes in terms of sure, research because yeah, yeah. I, I do deep dives and I didn't do yeah. super deep dives and all those topics. Well, it was a lot of just like a cool, like those, and it, it, the nature of the internet mysteries kind of don't, like there's not like so much research you can do just exactly. by the nature of what those things are. So yeah. Exactly. Um, but it's a good one. And I've been keeping a list of others that I've, I'm planning to do a follow up in the future. So if you're down for it, you can even come oh, back totally. on that I one. I love it. Yeah. It was really fantastic. fun. And so if anybody's new to the show, please go back and listen to Internet Mysteries. It's a really good episode. And so, Sean, you're you're an all around sort of storyteller, writer. You're the assistant director of an upcoming movie Ooh. that uh, that we both work on. <laughs> you um, and as we also discussed last time, because you work at Naughty Dog Studios, I just basically tell everybody that you created The Last of Us, even though. Yeah, correct. Not as true I, at all. <laughs> I think it mentioned uh, the character of Ellie is actually based on me and I mo capped and voice acted for her. So, right, right. Yeah, all, all of the above. All the above, of course, of course. <laughs> well, thank you for, uh, you know, getting out of your Hollywood high house. I don't know what the term I'm trying to think of. <laughs> it works and, for me, yeah. yeah I like that you have a high here. house. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and coming down to us. So today we are going to talk about Hollywood, which is something I thought you'd be a great guest for, because this is one of the legendary Hollywood mysteries when it comes to these kind of things. And that's George Reeves, who died by suicide at the age of 45. He was very infamously, and I'm sure as most people listening know, uh, he played Superman in The Adventures of Superman, which was a series that came out starting in 1951. And because of that, he was a larger than life celebrity and... Yeah, just a big, big, big celebrity at the time. So, of course, this story, when he he committed suicide and they found his body, spread throughout all the newspapers. It was reported everywhere. However, a lot of people suspect that there was foul play and that this wasn't suicide. And that is because there are a lot of strange details or strange facts about the case, if you want to say that. And this is also possibly the beginning of what is known as the Superman curse. This story and the theories have been explored in the movie Hollywood Land with Ben Affleck and Adrian Brody and God, just a bunch of others. Diane Lane. Uh, Bob ha yeah. Hos Haskins. Haskins. Yes. Yep. 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 Uh, otherwise known as Shmi in... Uh, <laughs> In, uh, or, or Mario. Yes, or Mario. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> most famous role, obviously. Yes, yeah, obviously his most famous role. None of these dumb Chris Pratt's. Yeah, Bob yeah. Hoskins is my Mario. Everyone. Right. Who framed Roger Rabbit also. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which so um, also in some some similar LA noir vibes. That's right. right. That's right. Same time period, same yeah. same same vibe indeed. Uh so yeah, let's let me back up a little bit and let's just learn a little bit about George Reeves, who he was, what's going on at the time. George was born George Kiefer Brewer 
which I think is a great name. Yeah. And he was later known as George Reeves, obviously. He was born on January 5th, 1914 at Woolstock, Iowa. His parents separated shortly after his birth, and he was raised primarily by his mother, Helen Lesher. George would move around quite a bit in his childhood, but they eventually settled in Pasadena, California, where he attended high school and showed an early interest in acting. He was also a talented amateur boxer, musician. He played several instruments. However, it was the allure of Hollywood that truly captured his imagination. Reeves' striking good looks and athletic build made him a natural fit for the silver screen, and soon he found himself pursuing a career as a thespian. George's big break came in 1939 when he landed a role in the epic film Gone with the Wind. I'm sure you've probably heard of that, right, Sean? Gone with the Wind? It's just a tiny tiny little movie. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Over the next few years, George appeared in various films, a lot of B-movies, some two-reelers, and some serials. But uh, as much as he wasn't like a big, big, big star, he was consistently working, doing very well for himself. And then World War II came around, and he left for the army, but he continued to make films for the military. But after the war, though he continued to work, his casting was typically in lower-budget serials. And it's important to note here that his paychecks were kind of getting smaller and smaller through like the late 40s, working on these lower budget things. It was his casting as Superman in the television series Adventures of Superman in 1951 that catapulted him to fame. As the iconic superhero, George Reeves became a household name. The role brought him immense popularity, but also typecast him, making it difficult to find work in Hollywood. Typecasting is still a thing, folks, but it, it it can be a burden to actors, but it, it's very different nowadays. You can actually kind of fight through that or use that to your advantage now, where back then it was really controlled and limited careers and actors. So since George couldn't get cast in other projects because of being Superman and a TV star didn't get paid the same they do now, he began to find himself having trouble paying the bills when the show ended. So thoughts, comments, or anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, the, the the typecast thing, like you're saying, is you know something that everyone I think is aware of. Uh, and to your point, modern actors, I think a lot of times successful ones use that, like, ooh, they played like a. I'm thinking something like Chris Hemsworth right now in Furiosa, yeah, yeah. where is a very different character than he normally plays, and it's to his benefit. Or the character he played in, like, I don't know the. 2016 Ghostbusters. You know what I mean? Like it's like they're they he's they're aware of that, hyper aware of these caricatures, these personas that these actors have, and use that to advantage. And back then, that wasn't the case. That that you, there was no like subversion. No one subverted things in the 50s. So. <laughs> no, no, and also it was the uh, the studio. Um, yes. Yeah. The studio system back then, and you were under contract. Typically, you could work kind of independently, but most people were under contract. Yeah. So it's like, hey, I'm I'm a skinny little nerdy nerdy dude. Yeah. If I got a contract as an actor for a studio back then, they would probably just be like, oh, where's our nerdy guy? Nerdy guy, Michael's on yes, on contract. Yeah. He's already getting paid weekly. Mm-hmm. Just put Michael in that. And you kind of get stuck in these things. And and people just, the nature of kind of the stupidity of the business, they just couldn't see you for anything else. Yeah. And even the the guy that played Superman in the early 40s, a guy named Kirk Allen, which I'll, I'll talk about again when I mention the Superman curse later on, Kirk Allen, the same thing happened to him after playing Superman in the 40s. He literally had no career after that. It was just basically kaput because people only saw him as Superman. Yeah. So, Something yeah. also I find even more kind of maybe not quite so tragic, but interesting at the very least is that from my understanding, though, too, George Reeves, he actually did like the role of Superman like he did. Obviously, it took a toll. He thought it was kind of for children. He didn't consider it serious, but he still liked that role. Like he still like understood that obviously it, you know, paid his bills and stuff. But I think he pl- liked that persona of being this this hero, this thing that ch- killed children could look up to. And and so it's this really interesting dichotomy where he was, you know, in one hand, he's embracing it is he likes aspects of it. And the other hand, he's trying to push it away. And it's this kind of like, you know, push pull thing that 
it's just really interesting. So. Yeah, it is really interesting. And he did try to use it to his advantage, as I think anybody would, which when the roles started dying out and he wasn't making a lot of mm-hmm. money, he was, I, I think he was like signing up for wrestling matches. Yeah. And mm-hmm. we've all heard many stories about him kind of doing like children's events and speeches, almost like the, the conventions of the day, mm-hmm. so to speak, so that he could actually make some money. And he didn't make... You know, he did not make good money on the TV show. It was a kid's television show. You don't get paid super well back then, but it was good. Like if Mm -hmm. you or I were getting paid the same amount now, we'd be like, holy shit, I'm getting paid really (laughs) well. But it wasn't what you think of as like a television star and it's going to run out pretty quickly. So, yeah, 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 it's it's all kind of interesting, fascinating stuff and also really important details for what's about to happen. So I do want to talk about a significant figure in George Reeves's life, Tony Mannix. Tony was the wife of MGM studio executive Eddie Mannix, a man rumored to have connections with the darker side of Hollywood. And Tony herself was a former Ziegfeld, Ziegfeld Follies showgirl, and she met George in the early 1950s, and the two quickly, quickly began a passionate love affair. And their relationship this is really important to know their relationship was open. This wasn't like a hidden affair going on. It was well known. They would go to parties together. They'd go to dinner and even Eddie Mannix, Tony's husband, they'd go on vacations as like almost like a quadruple a thing because yeah. yeah. Cause well, Eddie had his own mistress that oh, he would bring okay. along. <laughs> Tony, sure, bring them all. Tony, yeah, all, yeah. Tony had her <laughs> mistress, which was George Reeves. Um, they would all vacation together. They'd go to dinner together. So this is, I guess you would call it like an open relationship between Tony and, and her husband, yeah. which is just really interesting and, and strange and kind of progressive in its own weird way. It's also worth noting here that George was a partier, and I think that that went into all his relationships he had. He did drink a lot, in, not only in social occasions, but also at home. He'd hang out and have a bunch of drinks and had a relatively high tolerance for such things. However, as many Hollywood tales go, the relationship with his love affair, Tony Mannix, was very complex. And while Eddie, as I mentioned, was very aware of it, we don't know what would happen if, say, Tony and George broke up, which is what happened. George dumped Tony and she was devastated by it. And since they were this like open couple, I imagine Eddie probably heard about this very quickly. And we don't know if Eddie's views changed about George in terms of like a, a friendship. I'm probably explaining this way too, comp- making it sound way too complicated. The point is, is that Eddie may have yeah. disliked George after he broke up with his own wife. In a weird, yeah, it's a, in a weird thing. It's it like you mentioned, like oh, on some level, it's a progressive thing. But then it's on the flip side of that. It is also just this idea of like oh. If he did something to my wife, even if in name only, it's a reflection on me, right? And there's right. a very or ownership quality to that thing, or you know, so <laughs> maybe not as progressive in that way, right, Eagle. But yeah, you you could see potentially where there's some uh, yeah. animosity there. Yeah, and this feeds into one of the main theories, which is why I bring it up. We're just Mm -hmm. purely making up conjecture, Mm -hmm. um, but it is part of the story. And let me give you a little bit of background about Eddie right now. So Eddie Mannix is a name that looms very large in Hollywood history and lore. He was born Joseph Edgar Allen John Mannix. Wow. (laughs) When I wrote that down, I didn't realize how many names that was. Wow. Uh, (laughs) He was born in 1891 in New Jersey. And Mannix started his career in the construction visit business, which New Jersey construction, there's got to be a lot of heavy <laughs> mafia connections there. However, his knack for handling tough situations uh, sort of preceded him and he wanted to get into the film industry. And by the 1920s, he indeed, he indeed, he indeed, <laughs> that's a good did word. Get no, into, use it. You uh, invented yeah, yeah. a new word. He indeed got into the <laughs> Hollywood business, securing a position at MGM one of the most influential studios at the time. And at MGM, Mannix's role was officially that of general manager, but his unofficial title title was Hollywood's fixer. And if you've ever heard that term, and I think most people have, 
that started with him. Mm-hmm. He he's the big Hollywood fixer, and his responsibilities included overseeing the studio's finances, managing day to day operations, and crucially keeping the studio stars out of trouble, or at least keeping their troubles out of the headlines. And this came with a lot of power, and he would often use unorthodox methods to protect the studio's interests. And this included bribing police, intimidating journalists, and even it is rumored, I will say rumored only, that he employed violence to keep scandals at bay. You see Mannix's life influenced TV shows, movies. The Coen brothers did a film where Josh Brolin played Mannix. I forget the name of that. Oh, yeah. Film. The, uh, um, the uh, oh, Hail Caesar. Yeah, Hail Caesar. Hail, that's right, yeah. um, so that is that's Josh Brolin's character is is Eddie Mannix. And his he was married previously. His first wife, Bernice Fitzmaurice, died in 1937 under suspicious <laughs> circumstances i'll say so that's some background on eddie oh i'll add as well like because of that that job and sort of keeping rumors and scandals and tabloids and all of this at bay there again it's all kind of conjecture but there are the rumors that i i believe 99 percent of them that he did move in the same circles as a lot of organized crime people mm-hmm. gangsters those kind of those those kind of folks, mm-hmm. those so, legitimate businessmen, legitimate businessmen. Now, I, I need to jump ahead here to the night that this whole story, this whole episode revolves around. And that's June 16th, 1959, the time and day of George's death. It is commonly said that George was having financial troubles, as we've already talked about. However, there are anecdotal accounts and this is very similar to everything else in this story. It all depends on who you talk to. Um, anecdotal accounts that he had a bunch of work coming up. Things were for turning for the better. And he had like a new season of Superman. They were going to bring it back for a season. They were in talks for that. There's another TV series that he supposedly was producing and had written. There's another movie that he had like gotten somebody to write. And you just hear all these anecdotal accounts of, oh, there's so many projects that are going to happen. You and I both work and live in Hollywood. (laughs) We all have a bunch of projects. Uh (laughs) So I don't, when I hear these stories, I actually believe all of them. Oh, oh, totally. Yeah. But yeah. It doesn't mean that that it's not like, I mean, unless you're very naive or you've been the luckiest person ever. Yeah. All of these things that are going to quote unquote happen does not mean that they're going to happen. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So so just think about that when you hear the rest of this story, yeah. folks. Now, he had broken off his affair with Tony Mannix, I think like six, I don't know, it was more than six, maybe about a year before. Um, she did not take that well, as I've already briefly mentioned. She was calling George's house dozens of times a day. Oh, like, yeah. like really <laughs> brutally calling him. There's stories that she was having him followed. Uh, she also stole his dog, apparently. Like oh, this was wow. a she really yes. was wow. not happy with the breakup. On top of that, uh, she had also paid for over the years a bunch of George's things, including his house, his yeah. car, uh, tons of stuff. She was really financially his sugar mama, so to speak, mm-hmm. for, for a long time. And so that's got to hurt as well when she's devoted financial resources to this man. And now he breaks it off and he broke it off and started dating a socialite who who I will call like the influencer of her time, (laughs) um, a woman named Lenore Lemon. And Lenore was a New Yorker. She had met George. They had kind of fallen for each other. He convinced her to move to L.A. She complained about L.A. I was reading interviews with her. She always complained about L.A. She really preferred New York. But that kind of shows you how how much she was drawn to George, that she was willing mm-hmm. to move there for him. She She's a bit of a controversial figure herself. She was previously married to a Vanderbilt heir. Uh. There's some weird stories around some of her other relationships. But to me, I kind of read that as more of just, she's just a big party girl. She's at all the clubs. Mm-hmm. She's at all the events. She mingles with celebrities, with gangsters, with drug dealers, like all the above because of where she hangs out and how, how she kind of acts. I mean, it, it also, she's not nearly as attractive or I think charismatic 
the kind of like an older version of Paris Hilton at the time. Sure. Like yeah. when Paris was like just known as being a socialite and partying everywhere. Yeah, they're they're not famous by any I mean uh, even though a lot of Hollywood is not necessarily famous strictly <laughs> on their own talents. Uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Nepo babies. But uh she was even less like it was just like, oh, she's famous for being famous. Kind exactly. Of yeah. And there's I'm gonna I was I was gonna wait and bring this up later. However, so George and, and Lenore had been dating at, at this time for about six months. And you know, there's a bunch of weird stuff that you're all are going to hear about in, in just a few moments of surrounding his suicide. But there are allegations. Again, I'll just call it like anecdotal stories that George had been in a few car accidents prior to this night. And one of those stories specifically says that his brake fluid was drained. So there's mm. this underbelly of like, is somebody already yeah. trying to off George Reeves? I will completely state this now and not save it for later uh i've only seen that in weird tabloid things and okay. just like you'll see people post about it in terms of the newspapers in terms of the more official accounts i have not come across any of that okay. so i don't know if that's true i do think he did get into a car accident um but it was just like he just went off the road or even those kind of rumored break. things were they before the suicide or was it one of those things that like oh the the word spread after the suicide i think the word spread after yeah, the suicide yeah. yeah yeah so all right here's the story here's or the alleged suicide the, i don't know the alleged that's yeah, what yeah, we're yeah, figuring exactly. out. yeah so. that's what we're figuring out <laughs> so here's the story of this this odd strange night at least this is the common story, and I'll come back later and kind of correct some things. But this is the story. If anybody's come across this before, this is the main version that you come across. I'll set this up. You and I are going to read a scene in a second, but Ooh, let me give a little bit of a little bit of background, a little reenactment. So before we do that, George and Lenore they went out to dinner that night. Depending on which newspaper you read, it could be eight thirty, it could be six thirty, it could be five thirty, it could be three thirty, it could be nine thirty. <laughs> All we need to know is they went to dinner and that is very real and very authentic. Uh, some say that their house guest, a guy named a writer named Robert Condon, who was staying with them at the time, went to dinner as well, but he actually stayed home. So it's just Lenore and George. They go to dinner. They come home. They've been drinking. Again, they're big drinkers. They come home. It's a, probably around 11 o'clock to midnight. They go to bed somewhere in that time period. And as they do, or as they're about to, Lemon turns on the porch light. And this was a signal. This is what they would do at the house, is if the porch light was on late, it meant they were open for business to people to come hang out and have drinks. You hear it commented that it was a party house. Lenore Lemon later says, we weren't a party house, just like a It's like an open door policy. Yeah. Friends would know. To, right. Yeah. So the, the porch light is on, which signals people can come by. And again, this is the common story is that two neighbors, William Bliss and Carol Van Ronkel, show up, knock on the door, come on in to have drinks. And this is where the scene you and I are going to read uh, right. will start. So the way this is written, Sean, do you mind playing both George and <laughs> Lenore? Because you will... don't. Okay, yeah. sure. Um, They're the por parts I was born to play. It's the night of, wait, what is the date again? Just uh, June, June 16th. Yeah. yeah. It is the night of June 16th, 1959. And in the living room of George, Re George Reeves' home at 1579 Benedict Canyon, Beverly Hills, Lenore Lemon, William Bliss, Robert Condon, and Carol Van Ronkel are chit chatting away with cocktails and cigarettes in their hands when footsteps are heard coming down the stairs and George Reeves appears in a robe. He's drunk and mad. God damn, can you all be quiet? It's late. You're loud and someone in the house needs to sleep. Have some respect for Christ's sake. You, Bill Bliss or whatever your name is, you can't be quiet, I'll throw you out of here. Lenore tells him to calm down and the others invite George to join them. Come on, join us, George, come on. I'm sorry, I'm in a bad mood. I'm going to bed. He turns and walks back upstairs, drunkenly mumbling to himself. Lenore turns to her guests. He's going to shoot himself. They hear a drawer open in the bedroom upstairs. See, that's him grabbing his gun. He's going to shoot him. 
bang, she's interrupted by a gunshot. Oh my! Oh my! <laughs> yes, uh, good, good take on that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the that's the common story. Obviously, I've taken some creative liberties there, but the the important details are in there of what you commonly hear about this night. Meaning that all these people were over. Uh, William Bill Bliss and uh, Carol Van Ronkel show up at the door. They're usually in reports called neighbors, but I don't actually know if they really were neighbors. Um, and in fact, Carol was married to someone else and Bill uh, was was his own story, which I will get to later <laughs> when I clarify things. Just know that there are some things to fix in that story that is commonly told. So supposedly after the gunshot, Bill Bliss runs upstairs, he inspects the bedroom and confirms George has indeed shot himself. But here's where things start to get really strange and interesting. They don't call the cops for 45 minutes. Not only does that story that we just reenacted feel a little weird or incomplete, but there's some other strange things to this case as well. For one, when George was found, he was naked, not in a robe, like, because everybody says he was in a robe, walked upstairs, shot himself. Mm -hmm. He was naked. It's it's not so strange to be in your bedroom naked. So it's not strange Mm -hmm. in of itself, but it is kind of, kind of weird when you put all these things together. Yeah, especially like, yeah, like Sue, like if he were to have killed himself, would he have done it while naked like that? But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like you said, not in and of itself weird, but. Yeah, but when you kind of put it with everything else. So the bullet shell to the gun was, oh, let me talk about the body position before I say that. He's found on the bed. His feet are like off the side of the bed. His back is on the bed. Uh, and so he had like, and then fallen back after shooting himself kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. No, this is an audio medium, but Sean just perfectly <laughs> yes, reenacted exactly. exactly what would have happened. Um, <laughs> but uh, the bullet shell was underneath his body, like behind his back, oh, okay. which is also odd because how yeah. would that have happened? The bullet shell or the bullet was in the ceiling, which is also kind of odd because if you think you'd probably shoot yourself. So, yeah, I guess that's the question. The How was what was the bullet wound like? For, like if he was shooting himself through the chin, like, you know, that would potentially go up. But yeah. if it's, yeah, temple, temple. or something. It was temple. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it was temple. Now, I will say they did the 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 coroner's report that's the word uh did conclude that it was the bullet and it was from his temple and like all everything everything lined up and Mm -hmm. you know he he probably just had his head head tilted if he did in fact commit suicide but it's still weird it is still weird uh here's just other things not in any particular order he was drunk he had a lot of alcohol in his system. I think it was 0.27. I'm always bad about what the amounts mean with blood alcohol. I mean, that sounds levels. like a lot to me. I don't know. I just know like 0.08 yeah. is the legal limit in terms of driving. So that's right, f- right. three times that, yeah. I guess. So. so he was very drunk. There was no suicide note. There were no fingerprints on the gun. Oh, the gun was a Luger, by the way, which uh, I don't like know. The German I just think, pistol, yep, right? Yep, yep. Which I just, I don't know. It just adds a bit of character to this. Mm-hmm. There's no, uh, what is it? Burn, burn, oh, there's no like burn the marks. Scorch, the where, scorch yeah, yeah. muzzles, whatever. Right. Yeah. And another thing to know is that when you're trying to figure out if he committed suicide or not, a lot of people talk about those anecdotal stories of, oh, he had so much work on the horizon. Yeah. He was also a very like jovial and personality person. Mm-hmm. And he and Lenore were supposed to get married in three days. I knew they were engaged, but th- I didn't. I didn't know it was like three days, like a, a three very days. imminent. Okay. And it, according to what she said, is they were going to go up to San Francisco. I don't think they were planning like a big ceremony. I think it was just yeah. like, yeah, hey, we're going to go get married. Um, but those are things to think about with the suicide, because a lot of people that don't think he would have committed suicide kind of point to those aspects. Mm-hmm. I think most people that have been around uh, folks with depression or read about it. It, that doesn't mean like you can still yeah. want and feel terrible. And yeah, I think it often ca- it's cases the people who are the most jovial, not all, I guess it's not, o- not, not to overgeneralize, but the people that are really good at hiding, especially if you're an actor, someone in the public eye, you have to be very well trained in hiding that and putting on a very jovial persona, the Superman character, you know, that's yeah. kind of what people expect of you, even though they know it's an actor or it's a character yeah uh, 
it makes it so he yeah he I'm it, to me it's not crazy to think he is hiding some could be some hiding severe depression or other issues. So let's sort of cover real quick the there's like three main theories mm-hmm. and those theories are suicide which we we've just been talking about because that could be it really he could have committed mm-hmm. suicide. Uh, the other theories are that Lenore killed him, wanted to cover it up, had her friends kind of vouch for her that were there that night. Uh, she could have done it in haste or planning. But basically, like the theory is Lenore did it, whether she planned ahead or they got in a fight that night. That's TBD. The other main theory is that Tony Mannix and all of her uh, upsetness over the breakup <laughs> either had someone to kill George or had her husband's help to get somebody to kill George. So those are the three theories. Suicide, Lenore did it, or Tony was behind it. And all those theories, in my mind, all hold a little bit of merit. I have my own personal theories that mm. that will come out, um, but they all they all are valid in their own way because of all the, the strange things. And I'll leave us with this. There, There's... We're also two additional bullet holes found in the floor uh. on the ground. But all the witnesses say they only heard one shot. Now, later, Lenore says that she caused those bullet holes at a previous date playing around with a gun. Huh. But it is it is an interesting. I mean, thing. And did they trace that they were the same gun? I don't know if yes. they had that sophisticated yes. tracing. But OK, OK, yep. okay. they were the same gun. The gun was gifted to. George from Eddie Mannix, which is oh. interesting. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. It's still weird that there's no fingerprints at all. Like, I don't know. Again, maybe I don't know how high tech fingerprinting was back then. I feel like it had been. It probably was fairly well established by then. But no fingerprints at all. No fingerprints that's on the gun. Strange, right? And I'm gonna. I'm going to leave us with this, Sean, because we're going to do a second part and come Ooh, back to all yeah. these theories. And I'm going to tease that I do have an answer for the fingerprints, but there were indeed no oh. fingerprints on the gun. Okay. Oh, no, I, yeah. I, I, I'll stick around. I got to stick around for this. You got to stick around now. <laughs> Everybody stay tuned. <laughs> listen to the show. Subscribe if you haven't so you can catch part two of this this episode uh, or this story because now it's two episodes and, and all these little nuggets. They're all strange. They're all strange, and that is why this is still a mystery and why you have people that believe it's suicide, p- believe Tony Mannix did it, or believe Lenore did it. And we're going to get more into that in part two. So thank you, Sean, for being on. We'll return shortly. Thank yeah. you. No, yeah, I've had, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, to hear more about this. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, can't wait for part two. Part two. Superman part two. This is where Zod shows up. (laughs) Thank you for listening to A Study of Strange. If you haven't already done so, take a quick second, hit that subscribe button, rate, review, that really helps people find the show. And that way you won't miss part two of the George Reeves saga. You can also subscribe to our Substack to get episodes early and a bunch of additional content and articles about all sorts of strange mysteries. There's going to be tons of content on our Substack over the summer, and it's just a great way to support the show here at A Study of Strange. Thank you again for listening. Good night. <laughs>